Elam came to a bloody close after government forces launched a massive offensive. What exactly happened during the last days of the battle is still the subject of fierce debate. But it's clear that as the rebel perimeter shrank, around a third of a million civilians were trapped between the two armies, and tens of thousands were killed. The government says the LTTE were using civilians as human shields. Tamil exiles say the deaths were the result of indiscriminate shelling by the Sri Lankan army. Each has accused the other of atrocities. The LTTE was crushed in the offensive, most of its leaders killed, and thousands were captured and imprisoned. But the Sri Lankan government has so far refused to agree to an independent international war crimes investigation. Now, a UN panel has found that the allegations against both sides are credible. It says they may have committed serious violations of humanitarian law. As Juliana Rufus and Dom Rothero have been finding out, unless and until the truth is established, a final reconciliation in Sri Lanka may prove impossible. Some of the images in their film are deeply disturbing. When Sri Lanka's president, Mahinda Rajapaksa, visited the UK last December, he was greeted by protests outside his hotel. Many in the Tamil diaspora accused the Sri Lankan government of committing war crimes during the final stages of their conflict with the Tamil Tigers. My people, everything that My mom, my dad, small people, everything that This is arresting. This is uh, England, England, England is uh, police arresting. President Rajapaksa's visit was cut short when activists sought to arrest a top general in his entourage. The diaspora continues to distribute images like these to spur international demands for a war crimes investigation. These are dead female Tamil tigers, believed to be filmed by a Sri Lankan soldier. Yet last year, at a parade celebrating the end of the war, the president praised the conduct of his troops. The war for an independent Tamil homeland erupted in 1983 because the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, or LTTE, felt they were being treated as second-class citizens by the Sinhalese majority. Whether the government can now win the peace will depend on how it deals with what really happened during the final months of the war. I'm sure you've seen this morning's newspaper, which says that a resolution was passed by the US Senate calling on the Sri Lankan government to establish an independent international accountability mechanism to look into reports of war crimes. You know, you are, they are undermining the sovereignty of our country. Uh, now we have to put this past behind. And, you know, if you start talking about all these uh, atrocities done by, uh, you know, start investigations and, you know, we are uh, uh, atrocities done by the LTT and killings and all these things. You know, it, it's, it's useless. Now we have to move forward. Yet some in the military are anxious that two years after the fighting finished, the Tamils are winning the media war. They are keen to show us captured LTT weapons to prove this was no ordinary insurgency. They had uh, the access to sophisticated arms and ammunition, weapon systems, not only the ground forces. They had a, a naval ring. That's a submarine. Yes. And LTT uh, was, a, uh, was developed into a huge uh, military organization. For, for close to 30 years, they occupied certain areas, they controlled uh, major areas in the north and the east. The army says the only way to end the war was with a major offensive. But as a result, hundreds of thousands of Tamils in the northern Vani region were trapped between the warring sides. It is the question of what really happened to these civilians which refuses to go away. Human Rights Watch has been documenting abuses by both sides for many years. The government said from day one when it began its offensive that it would take all possible precautions to protect civilians and in effect it never did. Uh, it used a scorched earth policy and we began to see that uh, in January 
2009. The Sri Lankan government says that in this last stage of the war, there were 1,500 civilian deaths. The UN estimates at least five times that, and others put the death toll as high as 40,000. Establishing an accurate figure has proved impossible, because even today, the government tightly restricts access to the Vani. They don't want people to interview uh, in the area where the final assault occurred, and they're not allowing NGOs or humanitarian organizations full and free access. They say they are. They say everything's normal, but it's not. But under military escort, the government has promised us unique access. They want to show us that Tamils in the Vani are moving on. We want to find out how Tamils are coping with the legacy of this violent conflict. Our first stop is Kilinochi, the Tiger's former capital. It was the fall of this town in January 2009 that was the beginning of the end for the LTTE. The people of Kilinochi were amongst the first in the northeast to leave when the government army was advancing, and now they're amongst the first to have returned. This feels like a town regenerating itself, but the constant presence of our military escort prevents any real access to the people who live here. Instead, we film the scars of war. The destruction of this huge water tower was the tiger's most famous act of sabotage during their retreat. But it is the thousands of landmines they laid behind them that are now the army's biggest headache. It takes a long process. Uh, generally, the manual deminer can uh, perform up to 10 square meter per day. So basically what that means is that every inch yes. of this land in front of us exactly. has been manually examined. And, yes. The scale of reconstruction necessary in the Vani is huge. Where, where are we now? This is the main railway track to Jaffna. But there are no railway tracks? Yeah. They have taken it to uh, prepare bunkers. So you have to construct an entirely new railway line? Yes. The army is keen to impress on us that reconstruction is being done with local consultation. But it is clear who is in charge. Our request that we meet a couple of business people by ourselves turns into something else altogether. Well, um, firstly, good morning. And we mentioned uh, when we cleared uh, our presence here with the military that we wanted to meet some people in the business community. And um, we had no idea um, that there would be such a huge turnout. So thank you very much for coming. The fact that the army plays such an important role in the reconstruction worry Sri Lankan rights campaigners like Dr. Saravana Mutu. I've heard people say things look better, but they feel worse. Any talk about civil and political rights is seen as irrelevant at best and subversive at worst. So the argument is the government defeated terrorism with a single-mindedness of purpose. Now it will do likewise with economic development. No questions asked. You join the bandwagon and you proceed. We get our own taste of how tight the authorities' control can be when we try to interview one of the local Tamil MPs, Shivanyanam Sridharan. Even at a school sports event, the military is eavesdropping. And when we try to meet him at his office, our army escort intervenes to stop us. Meeting with somebody who's a local MP. Am I, am I speaking to the Major General? So basically you are saying in the Kilinochi area we can only film things that have been pre-arranged with the Ministry of Defence. I mean that, that feels like you're censoring the local MP. I mean is he not free to talk to anybody who's, who wants to talk to him? It's a big no to interviewing Sridharan. With our military escort we head east from Kilinochi. We're retracing the route of the advancing army as the Tigers retreated in 2009. The scores of military bases we passed explain Tamil reports that they feel under occupation. 
This is the crossing point between Kilinochi and Mulei Tivu district. We're just being handed over from one team of military to the next, and we're the first international TV crew that's been allowed to film in this area. We are entering the heart of the war zone. Uncleared landmines mean that civilians have not yet been allowed to return, and the only signs of life, apart from the military, are abandoned herds of cattle. But in 2009, these roads were jammed with refugees, as almost the entire population of the Vani fled the army's offensive. At the time, the government claimed there were only 70,000 civilians here, but later, over 300,000 turned up in displacement camps. This is the website of the Sri Lankan Defence Ministry, and what you can see here on the map is the advancing Sri Lankan army, the blue arrows, and also the shrinking Tamil Tiger territory here in red. What you don't see is the wave of civilians being pushed towards the coast. Trapped between the army and the tigers, these civilians were under constant attack. Ramanan was part of the mass exodus, working for an aid group linked to the tigers. Over second among Makal Setukunda under the table, and the Angla Kin and Adakum, a pretty Nangpono, Nan Tachira, Valila Pona, into Mugata Park, and where they came into Manavi, Teria, number one of our Matanondo. Ramanan says even today he can't reveal his identity for fear of government reprisals against his family. They are using the cluster bombs, <laughs> they are divided as 30 pieces, then everything's blanched. The government announced sequentially that there would be no fire zone, so people retreated to places where they thought they would be safe. Civilians had every reason to think that if they went to these places, they would not be attacked, but they were consistently attacked. We reach Putukuri Rupu, where one of the most hotly disputed incidents of the offensive took place, the army shelling of this hospital. This is Putukuri Rupu hospital, so it is damaged. How, how do you actually see what caused the damage? It's, it's, it's damage caused of some uh, uh, the small arms and some uh, yes, yes, shelling, shelling also. But when the shelling took place, there that were still seen. civilians in the hospital? Um, that I cannot be assured. Mm. I cannot say uh, if the civilians were here or not at the time of the shelling. I don't think. But these images tell their own story. Under international law, attacking a hospital is a war crime. We have not uh, bombed uh, uh, any hospital. And remember, there is no cases of uh, uh, incident to prove that there were casualties in any hospital. So this is why these are just, you know, uh, the propaganda used by the LTTE. Yet the shelling has been verified by members of the International Red Cross who were present at the time. And until the government allows an independent inquiry into this and other such incidents, the accusations and the denials will persist. By April, the Tigers and 300,000 refugees had been driven onto a tiny strip of land between the Nandivakar Lagoon and the ocean. Yeah. Colonel Senarad Yapa was one of the army's commanders. He takes us to the bank of the lagoon that separated his forces from the site of the Tigers last stand. My understanding is that we're the first journalists who've actually been allowed to see this area. Um, that site? is still entirely closed off. Because it is not cleared, I think. Uh, still the mine, the demining is happening and uh, I think it's a risk to go there until uh, proper clearing is taken place. Because it's given so much rise to speculations about mass graves so that are, are being covered up. Those are rumors only. But so far, nobody is allowed no, in there, no, nobody. No, no, no. Any international observers? No. Although part of the coastal strip was designated as a no-fire zone, 
Survivors describe constant shelling. The army says it was in an impossible situation, claiming that these images show LTT artillery firing from within the no-fire zone with no regard for the safety of the civilians there. The military takes us to meet a group of Tamil survivors who tell of crimes like forcible recruitment by the increasingly desperate tigers. Others don't know which side fired the guns that killed their loved ones. I mean, the LTTE uh, bears, I think, the most responsibility for what happened to the civilians in the end because they held them as hostages. They used them as human shields. Uh, the leadership never showed any real concern for the fate of civilians uh, when the final assault began by the government. For the Tigers, the Tamil refugees had become the last barrier between them and annihilation. The army gives us this footage, recorded by one of its aerial observation drones. They say it shows LTT fighters shooting into the sand to stop civilians trying to make a break for freedom. <laughs> Nevertheless, thousands braved the waters to escape. Many drowned along the way. In the end, it was Colonel Senarat Yapa's brigade which fought its way across the lagoon and captured a vital causeway. Now the refugees had an escape route. was the accomplishment of our mission. Prime aim was to uh, rescue civilians, and when they were coming, actually, we were happy and uh, uh, really happy about that. As this footage shows, Ramanan's experience was not an isolated one. It is these images, above all, that have galvanized the demand for a war crimes investigation. There is video footage which shows soldiers, government soldiers, executing what appears to be LTT cadres who are there with their hands tied up. And that footage has been authenticated by international experts. <laughs> no, you can say international experts. I have international experts who had proved those are uh, manipulated or created uh, video uh, footages, you know. Uh, I can create one, you fire shooting uh, your cameraman <laughs> and put in the web. That's a simple thing with the technology available today. The issue here is whether the two sides became the mirror image of each other in trying to win a war. And that's what all these allegations are about. Yeah? And I think that's what the country needs to know in terms of as to whether the end really did justify the means and as to whether the means have sown the seeds of future conflict.
In the end, it's in an army-run rehabilitation center that we get our most hopeful glimpse of Sri Lanka's future. Here, former LTT cadres arrested at the end of the war have just finished vocational training and are waiting release. Santiago left the Tigers 15 years ago. He says he just wants peace. Next door, psychologists teach Sri Lankan soldiers and role play a new and softer approach to interacting with Tamils. And over lunch, it seems the soldiers too are rehabilitated. When we leave, former LTT cadres and soldiers are engaged in conversation. Simply getting to know one another may be the most important building block for a more peaceful Sri Lanka. We finally managed to make contact with Shivanyanam Sridharan, the MP we were stopped from interviewing. Hello? Yes, hello. It turns out that seven days after our meeting, there was an attempt to assassinate him. And that's true of Santiago. When his day of release finally arrives, he faces an uncertain future. His family is there to greet him. Sudan Tavana Singer, the brigadier in charge of rehabilitation, has some final words of encouragement for the 106 former Tamil Tigers. But after the ceremony, the brigadier is besieged by a group of Tamil women. Out of 11,000 cadres arrested, just under half are still in rehabilitation, and these women want their relatives released too. Request for release of my husband. I have, I think, over 5,000 letters of this. So, so basically this lady is saying that her husband was forced to join the LTT when yes. he was very young, so he shouldn't be condemned for it. Is Nobody's condemned. Mm -hmm. Nobody's condemned. These people are given a second chance for their life. History is forgotten. Let's bury it. Let's start fresh. But for the Tamils, making a fresh start may not be so easy. Can you have national unity without reconciliation? Can you have reconciliation without accountability? You know, we may never get justice in terms of what has happened in this country, but will we get the truth? So that if we are to forge ahead into the future, we'll have a good idea as to where we're starting from. Santiago gets his reintegration certificate and heads off to start his new life. Time will tell how easy or not it is for his country to do the same. That's all for this edition of People in Power. If you'd like to comment on our film or any other matter, we'd love to hear from you on aljazeera.net forward slash English. Until next time, bye-bye.